Today we're going to look at Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. As we continue in and through our study of Mark. There was a story of a man years and years ago that purchased a new car that took it out for a drive. And he was out in the country and this was early in the the 1900s and you know back then there were very few roads and especially the roads in the country were um, were not as great as they probably should have been and this man is out cruising around in the country and all of a sudden his new car breaks down and there he is stranded beside the road and and he worries about it and he and he and he, he thinks to himself how in the world am I ever going to get back he is just praying that someone will come along that'll be able to help him so you know, after about 30 minutes or so, a horse and buggy comes by, and the man is driving that, and the, the man that's stranded there beside the road says, hey, buddy, can you, can you help me with this car? And the man said, no, I don't know anything about cars. You know, they were new back then. And so he continued on his travels, and the stranded motorist just got comfy there beside the road. And it was several hours later when another man comes by, and he was actually driving a horseless carriage. So the stranded motorist got excited and he said, can you help me? And so the man got off the car and he tinkered with it for a little bit and he was unable to get it started. So another span of time went and the same thing happened and it happened again and no one could fix this car and it was beginning to get dark and pretty soon here comes yet another car and this man pulls up and the stranded motorist says, could you please help me get my car started? Well, the man jumps off of his car, and he, he goes out, and he looks at the vehicle, and he does a few adjustments here and a few adjustments there, and jumps, onto the driver's, or jumps into the driver's seat and starts the car, and it runs, and, you know, the stranded motorist is so thrilled, and the, the man asked the guy who fixed the car, he said, how come you could fix this car and nobody else could? And the man said, sir, my name is Henry Ford, and I designed and built this car, so I know how to fix the car. And what a great thought that is. You know, the one who manufactures, the one who designs, is usually the best one to repair and fix things that break. And God is our creator. And, and, and who better to have come alongside of us and fix us when we're sick and, and fix us when we don't feel well. Today's message is entitled, Hey, buddy, if you can help, would you mind? Because we're kind of all in that boat right now as we're dealing with this coronavirus and the other, the other illnesses that are going around. Um, and so many of us are, are under the weather a little bit. I was sick myself a week or so ago, and we've all been through it. But who better to come alongside of us and to heal us than the very one that gave us life and that created us? I want to look today at the last or the middle section of chapter 9 of verse, uh, let me try that again. I still can't talk whether there's anybody here or not. It makes no difference. Um, Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14, Mark says, And when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately when the entire crowd saw him, when they saw Jesus, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. And I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it, was off, and it has often thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. And the father says, But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, I want to pause for just a minute there because the Bible says in several different places, for with God, all things are possible. And clearly we would know that, we would affirm that and acknowledge that. But look what this verse says. Jesus says, if you can, 
all things are possible to him who believes. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father carried out, cried out and began saying, I do believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. And when he had come into the house, the disciples began questioning him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he, Jesus, said to them, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. It's an interesting thing about cars, as we get back on to that. You know, you can wash them. You can wax them. You can change the oil. You can have them tuned up. They can be in top-notch working order, and yet they can still leave you stranded. See, we're really not in as much control of our lives and our situations as we think we are. If we were in control, every church in America would be open today. This place would be full. You would not be in your homes. You would be in church. At least that would be my prayer. See, we're not in control. This coronavirus has caused a pandemic and you know there's a run on toilet paper there's a run on sanitizer there's a run on soap so we can see that we're really not in control of too much no one on this earth knows what tomorrow holds and I know it's a a bit of a religious cliche but I don't know what tomorrow holds either but I do know who holds tomorrow and for me that's even better Um, I'm a child of the one who is in control, a child of the one who is in control of all things. Are we to be anxious about this coronavirus? No. Are we to be concerned? I would say yes. But what we need to do is bathe it in prayer and let God handle it. And we'll get into that a little bit more in just a little bit. See, Christians live by faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And then Paul explains to the Galatians in Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and and delivered himself up for me. And the writer of Hebrews expands this idea. In Hebrews 1, or 11, 1, uh, Hebrews says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then over a little further in chapter 11 of Hebrews in verse 6, he goes on to make an extremely bold and brash statement, but one that is so utterly important. And that verse says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now notice how powerful that verb is, is. Last week I mentioned in the message that God spoke from the cloud and he declared Jesus as the Messiah. He said, this is my son. It's a statement of fact. This is the Christ, the only one that's going to come to redeem lost man. And here in Hebrews 11.6, we see that same verb. Um, and, it, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. Okay, not that there's a slim chance that he might be, but we need to believe that God is. And today, I would ask you what your object of faith is. What do you have your faith in? Is it worthy of your faith? We all come in here on a normal Sunday and we sit in these chairs and we have faith, (coughs) excuse me, that these chairs are going to hold us. But do we have our faith in people? Do we have our faith in jobs? Do we have our faith in the United States government or in a medical profession? If we have our faith in anything else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to fail. There's just no doubt about it. 
We're experiencing that right now. And let me tell you what, there, there is nothing more wretched, and I am so glad as a Christian that this is as close to hell as I'm ever going to get because there is nothing worse, worse in my mind than a spring without March Madness. It just doesn't get any worse than that. We have a clear and concise understanding of faith in that without it, we cannot please God. Jesus asked the Apostle Thomas that since Thomas saw the resurrected Lord, he believed, right? That's what he said to Thomas. He said, well, you've seen, so you believe. Jesus goes on to explain to Thomas how blessed those are who have not seen and yet believe anyway. 1 Peter 1.8, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, inexpressible and full of glory. See, we are joyful. Christians are supposed to be happy. Well, joyful at least. A lot of things happen to us that don't make us too happy, but we can rejoice in the fact that we are Christians and we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we bring him honor and glory. So if you didn't know before, you must know now that faith is vitally important. In fact, faith is a must-have. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we as believers trust in a God that we have not seen. We have put our faith and trust in a Christ that we have not seen. We have uh, put our faith uh, in a Holy Spirit that we have not seen. We believe in a, in a resurrection that we have not experienced, an eternal life in heaven, in a place that we have not been. We are saved by faith, sanctified by faith, sealed by faith, and by faith we have the hope of glory. For two years, the disciples have walked by faith and not by sight. But Jesus is being prepared now to face the cross and his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and eventually his ascension into heaven. So the memories of, of, the, of Jesus are going to hopefully enhance the lives of the disciples after his death because they are going to then have to live by faith. One such story to that end is what we are looking at today because what we have here recorded in this book is the story of an eyewitness Peter as telling it to Mark who records for us what took place you know ironically history does indeed repeat itself and from the lessons of history unfortunately we never learn just as Moses came down from Mount Sinai after being in the presence of God to a faithless people waiting impatiently for him so too did Jesus and Peter, James, and John come down from the Mount of Transfiguration to a crowd of people that were faithless, and they were arguing one with another. And of course, there was in the midst of this crowd the scribes who were probably doing nothing but instigating and spurring it on and initiating things, and the disciples were not doing a very good job of defending themselves or their theological position for that matter. Naturally, when the crowd saw Jesus, they ran to him. In the Greek, the wording indicates that Jesus possessed a glow about him because he had been in the presence of God. You know, much like Moses did when he came from Mount Sinai. The people knew that he had been in the presence of God. And while though that is a, a kind of a nice idea to have in your mind, it really isn't the case here because it would have detracted from Jesus' statement when he told the disciples to not say anything about what they experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration until after his resurrection. So Jesus is not going to circumvent the situation and make obvious a supernatural event that took place. There's a couple of things that I want you to see in this text today. Several of them are redundant. They repeat. Um, notice first that Jesus questions. Jesus questions. He questions the crowd. Now, it's imperative that we understand that Jesus isn't asking a question because he needs an answer. Okay, Jesus was fully God. He didn't have to ask a question to get an answer. He knew and since the scribes were afraid to debate Jesus and his disciples were neither debating nor performing well, neither group offered an answer to his question that we see. Um, over here in verse 16, he asked them, um, what are you discussing with them? Okay, uh, They all remained silent. The answer magnified the fact that the disciples failed to handle the situation 
and gave evidence of the reason for their continued silence. The question asked was most likely to redirect the attention um, and the focus from the crowd that was on the disciples for their failure over to Jesus, someone that could instill calm and peace in this situation. Now, who better to do that than the Lord Jesus Christ? He steps in and he says, okay, I'm here, let's, let's regroup, let's rethink this thing through, and let's, let's take care of the problem. Um, peace needed to be restored, uh, and so Jesus steps in. You know, it's interesting because when we look at Scripture and, and we look at our society, we've all experienced this, that success draws a crowd, does it not? But failure equally draws a crowd because people are just as excited about a failure um, and seeing what's going on as anything else. In fact, you know, being, moving here from Dallas, you know, it's an amazing thing how traffic can get so congested in, a, congested in a big city. You know, I have never seen in my entire life so many thousands of people that are so intrigued and interested in a car beside the road that has a flat tire. You know, it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing, the number of people that have never seen that before, that have never seen a flat tire. But Jesus steps up here, and now this is not a good situation, so he steps in and takes control. So ladies and gentlemen, what is the first thing that I want you to see here is that the focus must always on be on Jesus. Look what happens when it's not. My life does not go well when I don't spend time in prayer and getting a word from the Lord. Um, and, and, and our country does not do well when we reject God. This is a national day of prayer, if I'm not mistaken. The president has said, look, man, when nothing else works, pray. Well, that's where we ought to be before nothing else works, okay? Demons have always been active in carrying out the devil's work. They do not usually make their presence known. They choose rather to operate covertly by disguising themselves as angels of light. It was during the earthly ministry of Jesus that the demons became a little bit more assertive and a little bit more aggressive, and they manifested themselves more openly. It is most probable that this demon that we're dealing with here today, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> would well have rather remained undiscovered within the boy. He didn't want attention called to himself. So we, we see that Jesus questions, and secondly, I want you to see that Jesus rebukes. He rebukes both the man and the crowd. First and foremost, we, must we, we need to establish that God's power should never be called into question. But that's usually the first thing that we call into question, right? When things don't go our way, excuse me. When things don't go our way, or we don't get an answer that we want, we call into question God's power. It's never a lack of God's power that causes the situation or causes us to be in certain circumstances. What causes the problem is a lack of our faith. If we go back to Mark chapter 6 and verses 7 and 13, we see that Jesus gave the disciples the authority to go and to heal the sick and to cast out demons. The authority was given to them. And so it was a bit surprising for Jesus to find out the disciples had failed in their mission. The disciples were literally not strong enough to cast out this demon. And sure, the crowd consisted of a large number who did not believe in Jesus, and the Father's face, faith was very weak as well. Jesus' rebuke was mostly aimed at the disciples because they are the ones that should have known better. Their inability to cast out the Spirit stems solely from their lack of faith. Fasting was not necessarily a requirement. You know, a lot of manuscripts add that Prayer and fasting are needed, but the best Greek manuscripts that we have do not include fasting. Um, Johnny Godwin, uh, a commentary writer, said this, The incident proved that only lack of faith and lack of prayer hinder man's full deliverance. When faith is not what it should be, we need to pray for a better quality of faith. Wow, how many of us need to pray for a better quality of faith? We all know because of our personal experiences and by what we see here in Scripture that failure will draw a crowd, as I mentioned, as quickly as success. The fact that Jesus began his rebuke with, oh, and you see that over in verse 19, and he answered them and said, oh, how many have ever started a conversation like that? It indicates their lack of faith. 
And it indicates that their lack of faith was painful to Jesus. Good heavens, you think they would have not gotten it by now, or at least something. In Luke accounts, in Luke's account of this miracle, we discover the harshness of this rebuke because Luke not only labels this generation as unbelieving, but as perverted as well. See, it gets more wretched than where we are right now. Such a lack of faith and trust was inexcusable because of the amount of time that, you, that the disciples had spent with Jesus. Jesus was completely and wholly exasperated with what was taking place. With his exhaustion, Jesus asks that the boy be brought to him. You know the old adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So Jesus comes down and he sees the situation and he restores calm. He brings the focus back onto him and, and then he rebukes and thinks, good grief, these people are not getting it. All right, let me take care of it. Bring the boy to me. So third, notice that Jesus questions. Well, he questioned already, right? Well, now he's going to question the father. Once again, didn't, Jesus didn't ask this question because he needed an answer. Um, the boy's father needed to answer this question because he needed to, to show Jesus how desperately he wanted uh, his son to be healed. Um, the boy was being brought, to, to, as, as the boy was being brought to, to Jesus, the demon threw him into a convulsion. You know, yes, Jesus has control over the demons in the spiritual realm, but, you know, this, this demon was going to have his say. Um, the purpose of this question was to ascertain the level of the father's pain for his son. It was to a person that his father was coming and not to some impersonal force. Okay, he wasn't going to a seer or, or some fortune teller. The man was bringing his son to the one that could take care of the problem. God is compassionate about human pain and suffering. Believe it or not, even though what we're going through, God still loves each and every one of us. He will do whatever it takes to get our attention. I'm not sure he has it yet, and I would sure hope that we get it or he gets it soon because I don't want to go any further down the slippery slope from, from where we are. But he will do whatever it takes to get our attention if he has to even break this country. God is compassionate. God cares. He is sympathetic and he's merciful for all. He laid down his life for us. So don't tell me he is not compassionate and does not care about what's going on. The boy had been in this wretched condition for his entire life. Such a state wasn't due to any sin on the part of the father or the son or anybody in his family. In verse 22, we find that the demon had continuously tried to kill the boy by throwing him into a fire, by burning him, and, and, then, and by throwing him into water and having him drown. Jesus uses this dialogue as a means to get the Father to open up about reality. And as a result, glorify God the Father who is in heaven. That is the reason that all of this stuff takes place. That's the reason that we as Christians were saved, to glorify the Father. Our salvation glorifies God the Father in heaven. Um, the Father and the Son's desperate struggle would soon come to an end, and it would come to an end permanently. As we shall see, the father did not exercise a great amount of faith. He did have enough, however, to seek out Jesus. So you've got to give him a little bit of credit for that. The one who the father knew could and would indeed heal his son. The father may have been encouraged by Jesus' words, understanding the perception that Jesus was indeed willing to, hear the, to heal the boy. Jesus is indeed willing to be, willing to be involved um, in your life. You know, it's interesting um, here, the way this man states this in verse 22 here at the end of that verse. But if you can, if, if you wouldn't mind terribly, if it's not too much of an inconvenience, would you help me, buddy, if you can? Okay, he needs some help. And fourth, I want you to see Jesus' rebuke of the Father. Jesus reiterates the father's question as an exclamation of surprise in that there is literally no way that Jesus cannot do what herein needs to be done. It cannot happen. The man says, if you can. Well, of course he can. And he is willing to do it as well. Observe the continuation of this surprise with Jesus going on to say that 
all things are possible, not just with God. Look at the end of verse 23. If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. What a comfort that is in this day and time especially. One commentary said, the lesson that faith um, is essential to access the power of God applied to all the unbelieving crowd, the father who was struggling to believe as well as to the disciples whose faith was weak and wavering. See, the father was clearly overwhelmed. He was overcome with emotion and the possibility that God would intervene and, and take care of the situation. Although he had faith, he also harbored some doubt, and we all harbor doubt. We second-guess God in a lot of situations because we're thinking, okay, here I am, puny little me, and there is God, holy, just, perfect, and, and all those adjectives that apply to God. And who would he be that he would be mindful of me and what I need um, to have taken care of in my life? Um, and so the father was overwhelmed that God would even give him a second thought. And although he had faith, he also um, was concerned because the father nor the son were worthy of a second consideration. But the father and the son needed relief, and relief would indeed come. The father needed help delivering his son from the demon, and the father needed help delivering himself from unbelief, and so many of us are in that situation today. We need help. We need to be delivered from our unbelief. You know, and that's part of the problem that we experience in the church today. One of our ladies just recently told me that they were interacting with other people and, and seeing how we act out in the real world and how those in line at Costco and at Sam's and, and, and hoarding all of this stuff are so concerned with what about with what's happening and, and what's going to happen to the small businesses in our area. Bathe it in prayer and sit back and let God handle it. He can do a better job than you and I. When we get involved, we just have a tendency to mess things up. Rest assured, however, the Lord is not hindered or limited in any way by our imperfect faith. He works in us and through us in spite of ourselves. And what an encouragement that is. Notice next, Jesus commands. He commands here the demon. The crowd was growing, so Jesus decides to speed this thing up. All right, enough time has been spent. Let's move this thing along here and avoid more pain and frustration on the part of the son, but mostly on the part of the father. Jesus ends the conversation and takes the necessary action. At this point, Jesus' public ministry is nearly over and he has nothing left to prove. All that was left was for him to instruct his disciples. And that's the reason that that's this, this miracle is recorded in Scripture. It was used for an instruction period for his disciples. The rebuke of the unclean spirit caused immediate departure, save for one last convulsion. Okay, the demon is going to obey God, but he's going to put up a fight first. It's like, I'm going to show you, God, who you're dealing with. Like that has ever worked for anybody that's not God. That doesn't happen. Finally, I want you to see that Jesus teaches the disciples. He questions, he rebukes, he questions, he rebukes, he commands, and now he's going to teach. The disciples wanted to know about their inability to deal with this particular unclean spirit. They were questioning. After all, they weren't new to this. They'd done it previously. Mark 6, verses 7 and 13, where Jesus gave them the authority. I mentioned that. And they had gone out and done it. They were Failures in this instance, however, because they acted on their own power, or in their own power, and the way they were acting was void of prayer. And Jesus pointed out that you cannot exercise a demon of this kind. You cannot exercise a demon without prayer and faith. Matthew discussed the involvement of faith. If you want to go over and read this account in the Gospel of Matthew, pride does indeed go before a fall. And that is what the disciples experienced here in this story. All right, so what? Well, Matthew 17, 20, the Bible says, And he, Jesus, said to them, 
because of the littleness of your faith. That was the answer to the questions. For truly I say to you, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from here to there and it shall move and nothing shall be impossible to you. Here it is again. Here it is again to us. Nothing is impossible with God, yes, but here it is us. The context of this verse does not indicate a level of faith that we use as a goal. This is where we begin. We begin with the faith the size of a mustard seed. And so many times we look at that as being our goal. That can't be our goal. It's something that we already possess. It's something that the Father in our story has already possessed. He had the faith the size of a mustard seed. He brought his son to Jesus. How many of us needlessly agonize over something? Um, we find ourselves in situations that um, cause us to be anxious and to be um, burdened with, with thoughts and with things that are going on in our life. And we, 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 just, we just put ourselves through this torment when we should actually be turning it over to Jesus, who can handle it. Teaching in Scripture is clear. Don't worry, the Bible says in Matthew. You can't add anything to your life by worrying. In fact, it eats away at your life. The Bible says that we're to cast our burdens on him and take his yoke, for it's light. We are also told that God will take care of you. He does the same for the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, but he loves us even that much more. So if he does that for them, how much more will he care for us? And yet we turn our backs on the one that can help us, the one that not only has the answer, but the one that is the answer. Jesus healed many without faith, not Jesus, but the ones that he healed didn't have faith. But here the miracle is connected to faith because that is the lesson for the disciples in the future. Their power will come by believing prayer. Man, do we need to pray. What a great time that the president would say that this is a day of prayer. Ironically, as you look around churches today, ain't nobody there. But that's okay. Pray where you are. Power comes by believing prayer. That man's weak faith, the father, was sufficient to bring the power of God to bear on his son's situation. In the same way, imperfect but persistent faith is sufficient. See, our faith is not going to be perfect as long as we live in this world. But what we bring is sufficient because God can indeed use that. I close with this verse. James 4, verse 2. And actually, it's just the last sentence in that verse. Now, we've talked about faith and how that we need to have faith and how important faith is. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as I read the last part of James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not ask. Imagine that. How simple can this be? Let's pray. Father God, we are indeed grateful that you have given to us your word. Lord, it not only provides the way for salvation and reveals your son, but it gives us the day-to-day -day instructions that we need to live our lives. Lord, we see how things play out when you, are, when you just let us go willy-nilly and do our own thing. Lord, things turn out really, really bad. So God, today as we recognize this as a day of prayer lord i know that we all have even the faith the size of a mustard seed and as we come before your throne realizing lord that we are infallible wretched worms and we don't deserve a second glance from you but knowing that you loved us that you sent your son to die for us that you care about us you are a compassionate loving god but yet you are wrathful and you will allow us to endure things so we rely on you and 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 so we will glorify you Lord, and we trust you in this situation. Lord, it's not anything that I can do that's going to get us through this. 
It's not anything that this church can do that's going to get us through this. It's certainly not anything that our government's going to be able to do to get us through this. You are the only way that we're going to get through this. So God, I pray that you would just remove the blinders from our eyes, that you'd bind Satan so that your spirit would have free reign, not only in our churches and in our lives, Lord, but in those that are um, busy throughout our country in the, this day and in the days to come. Lord, what a comfort to know that you're on your throne, that you don't change, and that you are indeed in control. Lord, we love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.